and Anderson said that was what he had done. In the past, had different experiences with Walt, but I thought that I would, not for exactly the first time, but for the first time to an audience, disclose some of the anecdotes and the experiences of my past with Walt Disney, since I know you're also very interested in his life and in this man. They may, my experiences, and if you can pick up some other experiences with some of the other people who have their own experiences with Walt, perhaps it will round out a fuller picture than you probably have now of this man who was, the nurse once said he wasn't just a human being, he was more than that, he was a force of nature. And that's true, Walt was a force of nature, and so maybe through my eyes and through recalling some of my experiences, uh, just a few so that I don't take too much of your time and where you are. I know that it's been tough to have to follow these very interesting things that have just been presented yesterday by Herbie Ryman and today by Bill Justice and Tony Baxter. They're very exciting. And so I just want to take you for a little trip into the past with some of the experiences that I had. And I'll start out by saying the first thing that occurs to me that I want to relate won't be chronological order, but after I had worked on the fantasy land and, and done the work on it, I had primarily been working in the animation department of the studio. Walt invited me one day to come back down. He wanted another attraction and to ride with him in his Packard convertible. So I was a little tremulous because Walt's reputation as a driver wasn't the greatest. He was, <laughs> he was always so involved with his thoughts. He was so carried away by the things that he was dreaming up that half the time, other people should know about it so they get out of the way. <laughs> and the freeway was completed. It had just been completed uh, about the year before, so we could actually drive all the way from the Disney studio all the way to Disneyland on a freeway. And that hadn't been so when we were building the line. So I was riding with Walt. He was doing a number of things that had me holding on the edge of the seat. While he was turning to me, and we were going this way, and talking to me, Ken, I want you to put this storybook land in. We'll have all these little houses, and you'll have these little canals. You're going around there. And, talking to me as we were going along, and in the meantime, there was a fellow that didn't know it was Walt Disney. And he was very put off, because evidently something that Walt had done, unbeknownst to Walt, of course, had aroused his ire. And he was going alongside us. And uh, Walt didn't even see him. And Walt was still telling me what he wanted me to do, and this guy finally got so mad because he wanted something else, he practically, just as we were coming to Harbor Turnoff, he ran us off the side, almost into the ditch. And then he went on ahead into the harbor turnoff. And I said, Walt, gee, man, I, I was really mad. I said, boy, that guy, we ought to let that guy have it. Let's catch up with him. I said, oh, no, 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 Ken, he might be a Disney customer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Life around Walt was, I'm sure, for any of those of us who, who uh, had that fantastic experience. We knew it was fantastic, by the way, while we were having it, because it was hairy. And we never were able to ever live up to the things that we felt Walt wanted us to do. But his, his, his uh, sadliness with these fantastic things made us all perform better than we even knew we could. Uh, I a little bit, feel a little bit like uh, one of our famous directors. Uh, Ham Lusk, who was the re man responsible for animating, or actually putting Snow White, the, the, the figure of Snow White, Walt entrusted him for the first time to draw a human being and make it move like as much like a human as possible. And Ham uh, was asked in a meeting by Walt, what, what do you think, Ham? And Ham says, uh, how do I know what I think until I hear what I have to say? <laughs> and I kind of feel, how do I know what I'm going to say when I can't hear what I'm going to think? <laughs> So, uh, forgive me, bear with me, please. Uh, Walt uh, didn't notice, uh, he was so busy trying to perform and, and get us to live up to his dreams that he didn't call a meeting of all of the number of us who were there at the time. Uh, I was in the same class uh, about three or four months behind Ward Kimball, class of 34. And there were Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson also preceded me and Milt Hall. But we all consider ourselves more or less a little group. Ward was the lucky one. He, he escaped the taskmaster who was training us in in-betweens. And he got up to working with Ham Lusk, where, he did, where Ham didn't know what he, what he thought, so he heard what he had to say. 
but Ward did and Ward helped hand because Ward was a superlative artist and animator and the two of them made a fantastic team. So, uh, it's funny when you stand up here, somehow lose the thought, the train of what you were going to say, and I'm sure it was very important. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll go on to something else uh, for a moment, because uh, I don't have too many of these anecdotes that, that might be interesting to you. I think while I was in Disneyland, I might as well give you one of the most interesting things. That I'd already worked on Fantasyland. I'd already put in Storybook Land. I thought I was through working on Disneyland. The reason that I was able to say what Kim suggested that I said was because uh, Walt Disney, after putting in Snow White, and, the original work on Peter Pan uh, and Mr. Toad, Walt Turner me at the studio. I was back at the studio working on Sleeping Beauty. He said, Ken, you can't just let that stuff go. You've got it in there. You've got to keep it up. He said, they don't know what that stuff looks like. They don't know what, how to repaint it or what to do. You've got to follow through. Well, that's the way he did, even though it, well, there was no business arrangement for me to come back down to Disneyland and do this. I was just supposed to do it. Walt said that. So I made paintings of every setup in each ride. And I had them photographed on slides and gave them to the head of the Disneyland maintenance paint department. So they would know from the slide and the number of the slides when they went through a ride what it was supposed to look like. And they could then interpret what the black light paint or the fluorescent paint was to be on that so that instead of just using green or whatever they had in their pan when they went through, uh, they would keep it up to date. <coughs> Subsequently, I found out from, from George, I asked him where he got the, my slides because they disappeared from the paint department for about 10 or 12 years. And in the first 10 or 12 years after I gave them this big box of slides, some 75 slides, all the rides were kept up beautifully. And of course, I felt real good about that because I could kind of forget about it. And then all of a sudden, they began to go downhill. And the rides began to be painted any old thing. And I, I inquired, and Mr. Smith, who, Larry Smith, who had been the head of the paint department, had no longer, was no longer employed, I think, I think he passed away unfortunately, and the box of slides disappeared. And from then on, it became more and more difficult to tell what these scenes were, because whoever the maintenance man was with the paint went through, had a little extra paint, but came and they said, finally, they didn't resemble anything. <laughs> so uh, it was a pretty good idea. It was a pretty forceful argument for our having to redo these rights, which I later on got involved with. So what they had done was take these, uh, George didn't have my slides. He had found, they were published in a book. A book on Snow White, and I, remember, I had the same copy. So I realized that not all the slides are in there, but a lot of them were photographed in the book, or reproduced in the book. So George, I just photographed what was in a book. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry that I sat there saying, I did that, I did that, I did that. But it was quite surprising to see these things on the screen. Wow, you know, that's the way it used to be, the way I did it. And uh, it sounds awfully conceited, and I suppose I am. <laughs> anyway, one of the other interesting things, I believe, that, that occurred with Walt was one day, uh, Walt kind of summoned me once more, and he, uh, if anything was true of this man, uh, an unfilled space in one of his attractions, particularly in Disneyland, was anathema. He couldn't stand the idea. He hadn't really thought far into the development of the Sleeping Beauty Castle, which Bill Martin, had designed for Fantasyland. And it was just a shell, an empty shell. So Walt said, Ken, come with me, you know, I want to show you something. So we went into this empty shell, and we had a third party with us, a, a really Ricardo Montalban, all white, wonderfully poised gentleman who's a, a, one of my favorite people. He was uh, Emil Curie. And Emil, if you knew him, was an immaculate man who was our interior decorator. Interior decorator, anything he, did, he decorated. As long as inside. So this being inside, I guess it probably should come with Walt. We went into this empty shell of this building, and here was a makeshift carpenter's ladder that went up seemingly into the gloom. And it was a, not a regular ladder. It was two pieces of two by four and odd pieces of ship lap with single nails in, some of them loose, up to a platform which was not wall to wall, really. It was, there were places on the platform where if you didn't watch for your step, then you could fall down, back down the way you came. Light was afforded from the from the fantasy land side through an unprotected open window. So we crawled up onto this platform, and Emil wasn't being talked to by Walt. 
always addressing me, telling me, can we, now you've just been working on Sleeping Beauty, can't we put a, a, a Sleeping Beauty attraction in here? Obviously, it can't be a ride through, there's not enough room, but you can come up with something in there that really will be a great attraction. And he was trying to get me excited about it. In the meantime, Emil thinking he better look busy, I suppose, in his white suit, his white shoes, white shirt, even a white tie, and stepped over a little divider on the platform to where there was a huge box. And in the box were a bunch of uh, gunny sacks. And not thinking, he picked up a gunny sack. And all of a sudden, in the gloom, looking at Emil, because he, 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 he looked different, he turned gray <laughs> from the floor up. And it was all uh, dazzling gray. It was like a shimmering scene. And uh, uh, then all of a sudden, Emil started to exclaim and hop around and swat himself. And he jumped over, I'm pretty sure he was gray all over. And he jumped over the, I've never seen anything like this. He jumped over the partition and uh, was yelling, fleas, fleas. And, and Walt and I both began to swat ourselves. <laughs> and this whole castle had some 45 or 50 feral cats in it. And Walt said, now, fellas, be careful. Don't be calm, be calm. He said, there's a phone, I'll take care of it. We've done the phone. I'll get a vehicle to get us here. We've got to keep out of the crowds. Down the ladder we went, slapping each other, slapping ourselves, got to the bottom of, this, of the ladder and walked on the phone. He said, hey, uh, fellas, he said, uh, this is Walt. And then, Walt Disney, that's who? <laughs> Come and get us at the castle. So we thought we were going to have a nice big closed vehicle or something to drive up to the back of the castle. Instead, one of these little two secret goat cards came up with it, goat cards. And Walt went on and got in, and he said, now you guys keep out of the crowd. And up and up and down, swatting the floor fleas like crazy. But I never had any idea fleas could be so thick. And uh, so Emil and I, we couldn't, we couldn't take it. We just, uh, we just thought, maybe we can't keep out of the crowd, but we can sure run through them fast. <laughs> so we took off, and we streaked through the crowd, and went over into the, into the service yard, and got into the uh, area where the wardrobe is, and they take care of everybody's clothes. And they had Walt in a space suit, and uh, all his clothes were being defleed, and they defleed uh, Emil and I, and it was a rather comradely time. Talking to Walt and Emil in these strange outfits. And in the meantime, Walt said, now look, he said, I don't want those cats, I want those cats taken care of. He said, they've got to be, they've got to be found someplace where they're not going to be injured. So, you know, that was what happened. He wouldn't let those cats be uh, barbecued. <laughs> he was a tender-hearted man, and he, uh, he really rather enjoyed taunting those of us who enjoyed fishing. And I happen to have that, uh, being born and raised in the Northwest, I just love to fish, love the outdoor, the outdoor country, love to wade in streams, and I graduated from worm fishing, which every fisherman who has a real love for the game does, it goes from Still fishing, you, you go all the way up to you tie your own flies, and you, get, you become so adept at this thing, and you kid yourself, that, boy, this is like a, creating a beautiful drawing. I'm just sending this line with this fly out there, and I'm putting it in the most delightful place, and I tried to tell him about that. And he'd always kid me. He came sent me a big fly that's weighed five pounds. He <laughs> <laughs> back from Texas called the Texas fly. <laughs> Not the Spanish fly. The Texas fly. And I have it on my wall. Love Ken. At the same time, he knew that I thought very highly only, according to the way they're supposed to be, only a fly fisherman because of the, they're the elite. So he had my name painted on the window of Wall Street, Ken Anderson's bait shop, <laughs> which was his way of. <laughs> uh, when I first got to the studio, my oldest daughter, Sue, was about a year younger than, I was hoping that uh, Diane would be here today because I think she would probably enjoy this remembrance. Diane and my daughter Sue both were youngsters, preschool youngsters in a little nursery school called, a uh, preschool place called Happy Land in the Felix, Los Feliz Hills District. And it happened that, as will often happen and, uh, amongst children, there was a ruckus, ruckus over the jungle gym. And Diane won, and Sue sustained a, a green stick fracture of her arm. Well, it wasn't too serious. They fixed her up. The green stick fracture is just, you know, like a twig with the screen is bent. It doesn't really snap. It just breaks. So they put her in a cast and everything. So sometime later, I was talking with Walt. And said, whenever you were talking with Walt, it was hard to know what to say, because it usually should be something very worthwhile pursuing. 
a subject that was worthwhile that you really thought was going to be the bot because he sure as heck could find out what it was. All this, so the only thing I could think of was Walt, your daughter broke my daughter's arm. <laughs> and, uh, Walt said, he looked at me and he said, yeah, that sounds like Diane, doesn't it? <laughs> Some of the interesting things that happened uh, way back, uh, Duffy Nash, whom I know you're all familiar with, had, he was the one who interviewed trainees who were to go into the animation department, and then other times Duffy didn't have too much to do. So many of us in the animation department, when we would get a chance to duck out, we brought over to Duffy's bungalow, and Duffy had invented a game. And the storyboards, which we used, Duffy had one on it, Solitex board with a framework around it, and there was a new thing that had come out, was a glass-headed push pin. Now, of course, they, they no longer had those, they were all aluminum. The glass-headed ones were really pretty tricky, and uh, they, were they weren't as easy to propel as the nice aluminum ones. Ducky had on his, on his big old uh, storyboard, he had a, a bullseye, and so we were betting. The middle one was 50, <coughs> thrown off to the corner edges, and nobody was making the pin stick. They were throwing that thing and they were having an awful hard time to make them stick. They hit the, wall, hit the thing and the glass was too heavy and the point we didn't get the trick. And lo and behold, here were a dozen of us, some of Walt's most trusted helper. Instead of uh, doing what we were supposed to be, they were goofing off, throwing these pins. And Walt came in. <laughs> and he always was clearing his throat. We knew that we, he did that just so he would warn us that he was coming. But this time he forgot to clear his throat before he came. <laughs> he cleared his throat, and he said, what you doing, fellas? He knew full well he saw it. He went over and he picked up a glass pen and he didn't throw it right at all. He kind of lobbed it. And it went right over and <laughs> stuck right in the bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, let that be a lesson to you guys. And I thought, yeah. Well, he was Starkist in many ways. This man was, uh, I, I, I don't think that could have had any, any other ending, except that the pen fell out <laughs> as soon as he left. Which is another, at least to another story, uh, Bill Cockrell, who's his, he was his brother-in-law for a while, had invented a yet a better game. Now he was, Bill didn't have much to do, at least he was cogitating on some worthwhile project, and he was leaning back in his little narrow room, and he had made a, a pea shooter tube out of a two-field cell. And he had arranged these little aluminum push pins with a little uh, fin on the back, and he leaned back in his chair to go, like that, and he'd stick it in the ceiling, then he'd time it. <laughs> the best that he had gotten was 30 seconds of his day, and then he would lean back and he would do it again. And he had just shot one, looked at the door, and there comes Walt, Walt's standing right under this thing. And uh, Bill would hide the tube, and using, you know, and he tries like everything to, get walled over the window. You're looking at something out here, the wall stands right under this pin. <laughs> and he's telling Bill something, and Bill said, yeah, you walk that, wouldn't you, how would you like to see what I got here? And Walt stands right and Walt stuck around there, Bill says, for three and a half minutes. <laughs> and, and Bill was just dying, and then Walt went out and shut the door, and down comes the pin. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a, you see, Walt was dark. <laughs> and almost at that same time, Walt invented what it was called, or decided that he needed to coordinate uh, all our work, all our efforts. We were out working on Snow White, so he set up a thing called a shaping crew. Bill Cockrell was one of those on it, and it is his most trusted story advisors. And they would go from one unit, we had units, in which there were different directors and different animators and different layout people and background people worked. But it all had to be drawn together, so Walt had a shaping crew. He came into, um, uh, um, this particular music room, I think, uh, famous, famous director. Anyway, the name isn't terribly important. You see, I'm getting along in years. I don't remember all. Uh, I remember the past much better than I remember the immediate, the immediate past. Anyway, Dick Humor was the man, and Dick was shaving, and he had a great big sunbeam electric razor, and he had a mirror on his desk, and we weren't expecting the shaving crew. They were supposed to come in. Very obvious, it was more or less like President Reagan's descendant on you all of a sudden, you didn't know he was coming. 
and all his security officers and everything can burst again. Here's Dick shaving. He hears him coming just a time that he couldn't un disconnect it, so he shoved it in his pocket. And this thing goes, <laughs> <laughs> underneath, the, underneath the table, in his pocket. <laughs> and Walt came in all sur sur serene and everything, and he said, I'll have a chocolate with Walt. <laughs> <laughs> There were some uh, rather risque things that happened. As we began to prosper, uh, Walt decided to make a... <clears throat> in the early days, the story department had a great deal of prominence. Walt was very, very interested in making certain that when a thing got to animation, it had all of the, all of the development that he could possibly afford. The characters were designed, the colors were known, the dialogue was known, and so everything was was preordained and very well cut. So Walt had wanted to glorify his story department. He had a big friend, uh, was a big musketeer, who was Walt's drinking partner. That means that Walt really didn't do much drinking, but he had the name because he wanted the name. He wanted to belong to the Vikings. And the Vikings were a macho group headed by one Paul Schweigler, who was an all-American football player. And they loved Walt. They, they said that Walt was a toughest drinker of the whole crew. He, could, he had a hollow leg. He could drink and drink, drink. It turned out that he had worked out a system where he and Roy, the Greek musketeer, they would drive to the doings the Vikings would have, and then Walt would secrete, would hold his drink in such a way that Roy would be wind up with it. <laughs> and Roy did all the drinking for Walt. <laughs> And everybody thought this Roy was an awful sock. He couldn't hold his liquor at all. <laughs> for both of these, for both of them. In the meantime, at the end, of course, Walt would have to drive Roy home. <laughs> but it was a very tender thing because Roy, not only when he was sober, but when he was drunk, would come up with some of the most exciting story ideas. And many of them have appeared in our pictures. The cat rolled up in the, in the screen door, in the uh, garage door, and that darn cat. And many, many things. He was very, uh, he also was known as a wrestling cartoonist. And he would break balsa wood camp chairs over the other cartoonist's head, or the other wrestler's head, and jump around making terrible grimacing faces. But uh, Roy uh, was a physical specimen in many ways. He also was, enjoyed his obesity. He was, he was really, let's say he was fat. <laughs> and uh, Ethel, his lovely wife, deplored that fact, and she let Roy know from time to time. Roy was a sloppy dresser, but he loved to drive big cars. And, Roy, and Walt, in the meantime, invested in two two-story apartment buildings right next and across the parking lot from the studio, the old studio on Hyperion. And in doing so, he renovated them so they would become his story department. So he gutted all the apartment-like things, but things that retained were at the end of each hall, on each floor, there were two in each building, were the lavatories. And then there was a flyway, a walk, between the, on the second floor, right across, so you didn't have to go down to the first floor to walk to the other building. You could go right on the top building. Uh, we weren't really the nicest group of young, we used to think it was a young man's business, and we thought we were young men for at least 40 years. <laughs> and uh, we used to love <coughs> practical jokes. And, uh, Walt had his place in that too. He didn't mind a practical joke. But it happened that Roy was, uh, we, we persuaded Roy that now that Walt had put him in charge of the story department in this beautiful new two-story apartment buildings, the story building department, that he should really dress the party. He should wear a nice suit and a vest and a tie. And of course, Ethel was very pleased with that. And Roy went down, he bought the suit, and he had it specially made so he could get into it. <laughs> and uh, was, everything was just fine. In the meantime, we had another quite heavy man named T. He. Actually, his name was Thornton He, but uh, he went by the name of T. He was a delightful fellow. And at that time, he was proud of his weight. And uh, we persuaded a little skinny guy who was brand new, little Joe Sable, who probably didn't weigh 110 pounds, to put on a pair of T. He's pants. <laughs> and then wrap them around himself and tie them with a belt. And then to call Roy Williams in and ask for a crit on this, this story idea that he was preparing. And to play the part, and Joe was a really constant little actor. And, and Ethel, in the meantime, had been after Roy, look, he was, you, you'd be much better off if you didn't, weren't so heavy. 
you know, you, you don't, you, you, the suit's nice, but it would be much nicer if you could just take off some of that glove. So Roy <laughs> came in and uh, he looked at Joe Sabo, and Joe called me, he said, Joe started to explain this story idea, as was the gag, and Roy said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's your name? Joe, Joe said, uh, what? Are you on a diet? Have you been on a diet? And Joe said, oh, yeah, yes, sir, I've been on a diet. I'd like, to see, I'd like you to see what I've done here, Don, so I, can, I want to make a good mark. Forget it, what kind of a diet are you doing? How much you lose? Joe said 180 pounds. 180 pounds? What in the world kind of a diet were you on? And Joe said, oh, well, what's right for one person isn't necessarily right for me. And we're all watching. Uh, what's right for one person isn't good for another. Whatever you do, you should certainly check with your doctor. And Roy said, I don't care about that. Tell me what you were on. And say, we've got sauerkraut juice. <laughs> and all he got out. And Roy said, Sarkar just he ran off of the room and he went to the phone and he called his doctor. All he could get was the nurse. He says, Is sauerkraut juice good for dieting? And the nurse got just time to say, Yes, that's so good. It was you got all he did was hang up and he went over and bought a whole quart, oh. a can of sauerkraut juice at the hub market. And he ingested the whole quart. <laughs> and this was only an hour before we had a very important story meeting. <laughs> oh. And the room was just absolutely filled with camp chairs and with a wooden floor with wooden chairs and a wooden storyboard, a storyboard, Celtic storyboard. And have you ever seen any of those wildlife series where elephants from the There's a strange sound. <laughs> time to keep a straight face and Roy was up there trying to rehearse what he was going to go through for Walt, which was an amalgam of ideas that we all had supplied, put on the storyboard. When um, he, he got he realized he couldn't stay there. <laughs> he ran out of the room trampling camp chairs and he could hear it was very heavy on the wooden floor, boom, 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 to the end of the hall. Bang, 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 and then we locked all the laptops. <laughs> And he banged on this door, and then we'd hear him go down the stairs and bang across the little one next door. Bang, bang, bang on that. And we'd go, hey, Roy Walt's here. And, 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 and so finally, Roy, you know what to do? He, had, he came back upstairs, still having a terrible time. And in the meantime, uh, Al Talaferro, who was one of our first comic strip artists, his father was the plumber. And Al Talaferro's father was only about five feet two. And where they ever got such a big plumber's friend? I don't know, the plumber's friend, he was, we called him to take care of, the, you know, he had been called, we didn't call, so that something wrong in the laboratories, and he thought, that we didn't realize it was just the doors locked, he thought it was something bad with the toilet. So he came over with this huge plumber's friend, and he came up to our room, just as Roy burst in, and, and walked in heard all this commotion, and he heard this elephantine sound, and he saw Roy was in terrible, terrible trouble, and he picked this plumber's friend up from little Mr. Tolfero, and he gave it to Roy, he says, Roy, I think you're gonna need this. <laughs> and Roy charged out of that building, and guy, we don't know the rest of the story. <laughs> Side. In fact, he was one of the most exciting guys. He was, I think, in fact, all the wives of those of us who went through the same period, the same era that we went through with Walt, will all attest to the fact that all the men became boring because all we ever did at any party was talk about Walt. And we thought it was, it was, to us, it was exciting. We couldn't help it because Walt was the most exciting thing that ever happened to any of us. It was just absolutely fabulous. Uh, we did some, a few other rather <laughs> silly things like that. There was a man, an Englishman, who, uh, not because he was English, but because he probably was smarter than the rest of us, didn't really mix that well with those of us who wore dirty cords <laughs> that would stand up, and, and we, we were all pretty much the hippie group of the day. We were very serious in learning the various things that Walt uh, uh, supplied us with. He, I had worked like the devil to get a college education in architecture and become an architect. And I swear that the education that Walt afforded all of us on working hours, although I must say working hours were seven days a week, uh, and all night and all day too, and you loved it. But nevertheless, the education that we were afforded through Walt's generosity and through his desire to make 
great artists, and at least get some intelligence out of us, that uh, was better than the education I had paid for and we spent six years in trying to get. As a result, this Floyd Gottfriedson uh, really didn't need all that education. He was a writer, and he was very much unlike the rest of us. He was very dignified, very self-contained, and he had some peculiarities the rest of us didn't have. We always would find some greasy spoon to eat in, various things to do that was, to us, exciting because of the type of people we were, but not Floyd. Floyd had a whole rack of canned foods that he bought at the hub market next door. There are canned corn, peaches, beans, olives, all cans of everything, just rack after rack in a little hot plate. And he made his own lunch. It wasn't that he was exactly a little from all of us, but he just didn't bother to mix in with the common rap, which we all were. And I don't mean that facetiously, we all were. Anyhow, we got the idea because we found out that we could steam the labels off of the peaches and replace the peach label with beans. And we didn't do it all the time, but we did it just often enough. So about once every two weeks, Floyd would become very, he'd open up a can of peaches and get beans. And eventually, he didn't confide in people very often, but eventually he was so puzzled he started to confide in all of us. He, he, he was really blessed with a very strange ability to, to buy food in the market that was that was marked wrong. He would only talk to them at the market. <laughs> how, did, how does this happen? And then we began to do uh, get a little more daring with it. We came up with more and more ways of doing it. And finally, he was convinced that it was just him. It only would happen to him, so he wrote, we said, well, why don't you write to Ripley? Believe it or not, tell him about it. <laughs> you know, and, uh, so he did. He wrote, and he, was, he, wrote, he was an Englishman. He really knew how to write English. And he wrote English with beautiful big words, English pronunciation. Everything went over to this, to Ripley. And so we thought, we've got to have some kind of an answer. Now, this, this is leading up to a good ending. So we found a way through the machine shop to undo the lid without anybody knowing it had ever been undone and filling it with manure. <laughs> and then we put a little note on top of the manure and sealed the can again so it looked just as nice as it was. And we, uh, this was time was apricots. We put a label on apricots. And we put it in a package and sent it back as if it was from Ripley. And so Ripley, he called everybody, Ripley replied to me, look, Uncle Ripley sent me a can, you know. So, and a little letter that this can happen to anybody, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Gottfriedson, and I said, I, I, you know, if you don't believe it, just open this can and you'll see what I mean. So Gottfriedson opened the can in front of all of us, and here's the little note that said, believe it or not, this is what I think of your story. <laughs> By the way, I, I don't know just how to arrange this, but I had anticipated that uh, I've got a of course, this is a whole lifetime, so I could go on with this sort of anecdote for a long, long time. But I had anticipated that maybe you would get more out of this after I, I go through a few more of these, whatever you suggest, or that you would that I'd open up for you to ask me any kind of questions that I might be able to answer. So, do you think I should have a few more anecdotes first? Oh, and then yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the uh, that, that I'm sure. You, this is such a knowledgeable group, you know, I found that most of you know more about me than I do. Uh, but uh, did you know about the episode of me and Walt's mustache? Well, uh, those of you who do know it, I drive you to suffer with me. It was during the war, and I had been reassigned from the Navy, which I was a Naval Reserve officer, to work at the studio on Naval, work for the Navy, on Navy making pictures for fighting the war in the Pacific, airplanes and its weather and all those things, and the, uh, my mentors were uh, the big brass, all the scrambled eggs and Alexander de Sversky. and so I would work with these important people and we'd have meetings with all of these important Navy people, and the unit was closed off, it was part of the studio, but it was actually separate. Nobody who was still working at the studio who wasn't attached to the Navy had any access to these rooms. They were closed off with Marines and guns and all that sort of thing at the entranceway where there once had been beautiful secretaries that brought us coffee. 
now there were these Marines with guns. And we, I went in and I was preparing this and I was really feeling quite expensive. At that time I was a heavy smoker. And I, I really couldn't, didn't have any reason for quitting smoking and it was my, near my birthday and my wife had given me a new Bronson cigarette lighter. And I had unfortunately overfilled it with, with uh, lighter fluid. And you can't tell that you've done that by looking at it or feeling it right away. And I put it in my pocket and I was anxious to have this meeting be a success. So I went by the Marines and into my room and I had all these boards arranged so that the, I could make a big showing and put over these points. And Mr. Alexander de Sibirsky was there, but sitting right next to me in the front row, the front row, and then behind us were all these other admirals and people playing. And it was Walt, and then there, on this side of him was Alexander, Alexander de Sibirsky. Well, Walt didn't usually want a guy to jump right up and start telling something. He could give you a flu. Now, Ken, why don't you get up and tell us what you got here? So I sat there patiently and confidently and watched Walt with a nice mustache, <coughs> take a cigarette out and put it in his mouth, and it was hanging there. So I took a cigarette out and put my mouth hanging there, and I got my cigarette lighter to make a big hit, and I was going to light it for him <laughs> before I lit mine, being polite. But evidently, Sversky had attracted his attention. So Wolf turned away, the cigarette was still in his mouth, he turned away, he was talking to him, and he wasn't there very long. When he came back, I, I flashed the cigarette lighter, which happened to be, unfortunately, right under his nose. And have you ever sensed a chicken? <laughs> well, the aroma, the odor was fantastic. And he uh, jumped out of his chair, and he faced me, and said, what the? <laughs> he tried to burn me up, and he sailed out of the room. I haven't even explained my story for <laughs> Sversky and all of the other Navy people all got up dutifully and filed out too. So I was like the little skunk. I was sure my whole career was over. So, well, I can always go back into architecture. This was an awful blow. And I wondered how I would face Polly, go home and tell her what had happened. And of course, one thing to do was to throw this wonderful cigarette lighter as far as I could and quit smoking. All those things that I could do were too late now. But I was certain that I was, that my goose was cooked and I was sure of it when I had nothing else to do but leave the unit. I went out of the unit and the word had spread. I don't know how it got out, whether, but all my friends that were already in the service who happened to be in the various wings would see me on all they got. They went, anything to do with me. And I clear a hall, or clear the, the uh, street that fast just by appearing. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be in, around me. I, my aroma was bad. So I slunk home, and terribly dejected, as you might imagine. I confessed to Polly that I was never going back there. And she said, oh, yes, you are. No, can't go back, can't face that. So she said, you're going back there. So she persuaded, I don't know how, but she persuaded me, and I went back, and I did. I slunk in. And I was sitting there, again, not knowing what to do, and time passes so slowly. And then something which was so rare, almost never happened to me, and very few others, was Walt. He called on the phone about 9.30, he said, Ken, what do you do for lunch? Well, you know, it's just, in those days, our lunch room was, we didn't have special rooms like the Coral Room and the Gold Room and all those things for important people. We had one big, cafe, noisy cafeteria. But Walt loved it because there was a man in there who ran it, who always saw to it that Walt got extra good food. And Walt used to tell everybody that Victor makes the most best food. In the meantime, we could lots of food. He would be sitting right at the table with Walt, and Walt would get a hamburger that was big and juicy. With all of a we'd open up our bun and look at a little right there. Walt said, "Aren't these great?" <laughs> well, anyway, uh, he said, "What are you doing for lunch?" And I said, uh, "Whatever." I, he said, "He's free for lunch." I said, "Yes, I am." And he said, I'll pick, you up, I'll pick you up at a quarter after 12. I'll come by your room. Well, boy, you know, Gabriel couldn't have made a happier sound on his trumpet or something. I just was just, well, at first, at first I really, I wondered if there was, if he had some trick way that he was going to torture me. <laughs> and then I thought, no, I just not like him. He's, he's really, he's really a nice guy and he, he's forgiving me. This is the way he's going to forgive me. So sure enough, he came by, and I figured out all later, why did he come by at a quarter after 12? Because everybody stood in line in this cafeteria. He had set up a wonderful deal where everybody on the lot, he wanted people to have good food for very little money. And that was just like Paul. And we did have, uh, if we could go at a time when Victor wasn't around, we could get good food. <laughs> and uh, Walt had in mind, if he went at 12 o'clock, 
most of these people wouldn't see him with me. But I'm sure he must have figured out that if I take Ken over there to Court Actors Hall and show everybody that Ken's still not in the, not in the doghouse anymore. It was his way of showing that. But I didn't dare ask him. His mustache was gone. <laughs> he had a huge, big water blister on the end of his nose. And uh, it wasn't something you want to laugh at. Like, not in front of him, you know. But, but, and I didn't want to even say, gee, I'm sorry, or anything like that. I just pretended that everything was all right, and he immediately started to talk to me. He knew, as he always seemed to do, everything I had on this storyboard, even though I'd never seen him be in the room. He knew everything that I had thought of, everything was up there, probably, even the things that I hadn't known I was going to think of yet. <laughs> thought of. So he was busy explaining to me how he wanted me to handle this thing when we walked over to the commissary, and we walked in together. And he let it be seen by everybody in the studio, practically everybody in the studio, that he and I were together and that ostensibly I must be forgiven. After that, people didn't disappear anymore. <laughs> they, they accepted me back to me. And they, they, so that was uh, a reason I explained that to you or give me that incident because I think it's very indicative of the inner gentleness and kindness of this man who could uh, have some employee so thoughtlessly treat his face <laughs> the way I did, and still forgive him, and then go out of his way. He didn't need to do that. Go out of his way to set things up so that the studio would also feel I was okay. From the very beginning, <coughs> Walt was uh, the I knew him, and I guess it must have happened way before. I think Walt he wasn't a magnificent actor. He was a real Charlie Chaplin. He just happened to choose this medium, and I think he always had wanted to make more than just an animated picture. One reason must have motivated him to try to do Snow White. <clears throat> and of course, that seems like a, like a very commonplace thing. Of course, we did Snow White. But in those days, the very idea of a bunch of cartoonists who did little three figures running around, and we were adventurous because we put music and we put color with all those features and things up to, to try to present real people in a, in a, a cartoon that long was unthinkable, so we wanted to do it, but uh, the idea of doing it was so outlandish that, that even the bankers couldn't believe it. Nobody kept giving him any money or believing to do it. But, of course, <laughs> he turned out we did. He wanted everything to be real. He wanted all the people in there to be, he wanted the audiences to come and be, because they had no other frame of reference while they were in the theater to accept these drawings as real photographs. Or would not even think about it. They just accept them as real people. So he wanted the personalities to be that well developed. So you got to know all of these characters just as if they were real characters and good actors. And he bent every effort to achieve that. Later on, I unwittingly uh, introduced Xerox lines, which I did for an economic reason and also an artistic reason. And it very much hurt him because he wanted no lines to show. If you are, and you all are, are, very conversant and knowledgeable about cells, you know the Snow White cells, the colors on the girl were all self-lines, the color of the cheek was the paint of the cheek, colors, uh, the only black lines really were around the eye eyes. And everything was as soft as it could be. We even softened the covers, the turns with the uh, airbrush. And that was what pleased, that was of course very pleasing to him. So, any idea that, uh, uh, things would be probably more lifelike if they moved around more successfully and showed lines wasn't something that was, was that he was aiming for. And I managed to upset that apple cart when he wasn't really expecting to have that attack from me from the rear uh, while he was involved in uh, other things, but with Dalmatians. And to explain my motivation on that was the fact that he had told us that after City Beauty, that we weren't going to make any more because it was eight, well, eight million dollars. We were thinking Beauty and Sleeping Beauty didn't go too well. And of course, I, then I went to Ub Iwerks and I asked Ub if we could use Xerox because I love, love animation. When we were in any kind of a sweat box or any of the animation was coming on, it was the original animation, drawings that had, were rough, but they had, they had become creations that were alive because they were the things that the animator wasn't really thinking about his technique or how this drawing was, but it was coming right out of his mind. It was a, it was a, a, 
creative effort that was appearing on the cell. Now, if that could be translated to the screen without the intermediate step of tracing, which has a tendency to sterile, sterilize it. When you trace something, you're aware of what you're doing. When you're creating animation, you're not aware of what you're drawing. You're wearing, aware of what the idea is. So I th and the animators I knew would love this. So we got everything all set to go, and I was even going to go further than that. I wanted one world to happen. I wanted to have the backgrounds and the whole appearance be done in exactly the same manner, and even on celluloid, without painted backgrounds in the sense of uh, watercolors, but the way we do the animation, where the drawings are drawn in a three-dimensional drawing, but they're painted flat in various areas. So it's a strange thing where you have an animation character that's drawn to appear round, locked in a space which is pretty be a volume, and yet he's painted flat colors because we couldn't do any other thing. Why not do the background in a designing way exactly like that? and draw all the backgrounds so that there are areas in it that you would paint with cell paint. And instead of having the expensive backgrounds painted, the layout men would, and the directors would say, we want these colors and these backgrounds, and they'd be done by the paint department. They paint the background. So I showed Walt some tests of that, and he didn't like that. Now, you can't do that. He didn't realize that I meant to do that with the characters, too. So I, did, I changed, and I, I did the same thing, but I did it with painted watercolor backgrounds, and I had the line's still there in the background. And then I went ahead with the characters. When he finally was aware that what I was doing, he was terribly upset. And, uh, and I can see now, and I could see within a year after I had done it, what I had done that I hadn't understood that it bothered him so. And luckily for me, just before, I met him just before he passed away, and I'm pretty certain that he forgave me for that effort. He'd heard that there were people who liked it. And, uh, so I, and also, uh, Xerox became very important. Everybody's using Xerox now. <coughs> we did have to change some of our technique and sort of stone the other things because he wanted everything in the way of a background to have a stage lighting, a spotlight. Thank you so much. I think I pursued that about far enough. I got involved in other than animation uh, early in the in the game, because um, he was he made use of everybody's talents. If I had gone to the extent of getting myself an an education in architecture, I must know something about perspective. And he was always questing for something things to make his pictures more real. And as you know, if you pivot a camera, which is called a pan, it's the same thing as just pulling a painted background. So nothing changes in perspective. You might as well it's just, it's just like the, you turn your head from side to side and everything stays in the same relative position. But if you take a camera and you dolly it across the room, which is also a pan, everything in it is changing in relationship to everything else depending on how far it is from the lens. He wanted to do that. We even worked on a monoplane crane to come up with a thing like that. But in the meantime, we were doing the Three Little Kittens, and I was in junior animation with Mel Call, Frank Thomas, Molly Johnson. We were all getting scenes to do Little Kittens. And Walt said, hey, Ken, do uh, you know perspective? Yes, sir, I know perspective. He said, well, you know, here's what we can do. He said, it's, it's, a, it's like a, a move the camera on a dolly. As we go across the room, we follow these little kittens. You'd animate the little kittens, go across the room, the floorboard, and under the chairs and the tables and everything. We'd have them jump up on a little step figured everything out to make it tough. You jump up on the piano and start to play the keys. So that meant that's a real workout, even if you don't understand perspective. And uh, I didn't know how poor my perspective was. So I got involved. But I got really deeply involved and I did it. I got a shot and it was a lot of stroke. You know, unfortunately I didn't understand stroke. But actually it, it pleased him, which of course pleased me. So from then on he figured that he used me a little differently than he would use me in character animation. He'd have me, he called me his jack of all trades. So whenever there was a strange thing coming up, like he wanted to put live people in, in animated backgrounds, like in Uncle Remus, or uh, uh, ducks and characters in the live background, I was the guy that he asked to come and help him do that. So it was a very interesting sidetrack that he got me involved with. And uh, I say I thank him for that uh, broad opportunity. It made, made it possible for me to get to uh, experience a little bit more intimacy with him. And it led to a thing 
which, because we're close to Disneyland, I think I'll jump over some of the anecdotes and tell you how I feel that I was part of one of the little roots that led to the trunk of the tree that you might liken to the Disneyland that exists today. There are many roots to this trunk, as it turns out. And you'll understand what this root was and what part it played when I tell you that. <coughs> Walt came to me one day, he says, you know, you guys, he says, you drawing and painting and having a good time. And he said, I can draw too, you know. He says, I'm an artist. He said, I can draw, I can paint, do all these things. And he said, uh, I'm gonna take, I take you off the payroll, Ken. I'll pay you out of my pocket. He said, you and I have a key to the one room on the third floor. And he said, you draw and paint, you know, the kind of things Norman Rockwell did. Covers Americana. Well, I know he didn't mean that as good as Norman Rockwell, but he meant that, that type of subject that would intrigue it, and he says, I'll, just, I'll build them, and I'll make them work. He said, we'll make them little, and we'll have them go around the world in a little traveling exhibit, and we'll have them on little stands with the black curtains between them and the great electric eyes, you walk in front of one, Why the little exhibit will be there, and it will talk to you, and it will notice you, it will come alive, and it'll be all these little figures in there, and I'll, I'll carve them, paint them, and draw them, all that sort of thing. Well, I did 24 of these, things, of which three, which he built. But in the course of building them, he became just like everything else he did. He was so far out in front of everything that he didn't have time to uh, devote to do all the work that would be necessary to carve each character. He finally asked me to make many, many drawings of the head so that he would know how to carve it all the way around. <clears throat> and the first one that he wanted to pick on was a simple one, was one in which he said Buddy Epson could be his tap dad. little soft shoe dancer on a little Midwestern stage with the little kerosene lamps. And then the second one was a Granny Kincaid in her cabin, and he looked at, he met her in the cabin, she was making a comforter, and out the window were sheep and so on. These were little tiny people. He wanted to move, <coughs> and he wanted to talk. Well, it got into one of those things where he finally had to, he never had to admit it, but he got to, had to hire an engineer, Roger Brogy, he had to hire an animator to come in and help Roger how to figure out how to animate these things with little wires and toys and cogs and all this stuff went off very difficult in a small one-inch figure. And uh, in the incident, incidentally, in the, during this time, <clears throat> about a month went by, and I was used to being paid every week. And he had said, I'll take you off the payroll, which he had done, and I'll pay you out of my pocket. And one day, I don't know how long it's gone, but I was getting really itchy, because we were living on paychecks. They weren't too much anyway. And, and Walt said, hey, Ken, did I pay you last week? And I said, no, Walt, you haven't paid me at all. Major then he started to pay me too much. You know? And I you couldn't say, well, hey, that's way too much. <laughs> so you, uh, and it wasn't way too much, but nowadays. <laughs> Anyhow, he was very good. He just had overlooked the thought. But anyway, he would take me with him to find moldings and, and things so he didn't have to carve them all. We'd go downtown to uh, Crestwood shops where they had different shaped moldings and things like that and put them all together and he'd build these things. But he became so unhappy with the fact that he was restricted to this tiny size and the fact that they had to cram so much in the way of uh, pulleys and gears and wires and these tiny little things just really didn't work. In the meantime, he began to get interested or somebody talked to him, so why don't you make them full size? Then you can do it electronically. You don't have to have all those wires and pulleys and stuff in there. So that's where it bridged off, and it became something that became much bigger in his mind. It was Disneyland, Disneylandia <coughs> to this point, with all these little things that he was going to carry around. No more, to, we didn't do anymore. He, he did bring on another man, Harper Goff, to continue what I had been doing, making these things, but he didn't build anymore. Instead, he got all involved in full-size, the thing that led to audio animatronic figures. So I think that this experience was one of the little ripples that led to the trunk of the tree, as I say, which became the Disneyland we know today. Uh, Walt never claimed to be an artist. He was quite proud of the fact that he didn't want to, he didn't want to, to uh, masquerade under false pretenses. I and mean, people would pretend or accuse him of being a great artist. He'd deny it. He said, I'm not an artist. It's a cartoonist that they're trying to entertain and make people happy. Well, it so happened that after Sleeping Beauty, I was invited to go with Walt to a very, very posh uh, celebration of the Bohemian Club in San Francisco. That's the elite of San Francisco, where they were going to eulogize his great creativity, his great artistry, and they had, unbeknownst to him, had come up with their most promising young sculptor to create a marvelous 
uh, sculpting piece in honor of, of Walt's creativity. And uh, Walt had uh, tried to deny to this crowd who were eulogizing him as a great artist that over and over again he would say that he wasn't and he would try to explain what he was trying to do and all that he was trying to do and please don't confuse these. I'm no Salvador Dali, I'm no Picasso, I'm not an artist, I'm just a, a cartoonist that's trying to do things the best I know how. And they wanted to present him anyway with this marvelous piece and they brought this young creator, sculptor up to present it to Walt and it was a bronze with little as Tony, my little figment sticking up a bronze, and Walt was there, and Walt never meant to be rude, but he said, hey, what is that? It looks like a burnt turkey. <laughs> <laughs> In front of all of these intelligentsia, a magnificent group, people just beautifully dressed. And uh, you could hear the silence, this awful thing Walt had said, Walt didn't know. But the, the young man was of the same quality and same ilk that Walt was. He understood perfectly. He said, Walt, it sure does kind of look like a turkey. He said, you know what it is, Walt? Very easy was Walt, right off the bat. He said, what it meant, what I meant it to be, was a seed. He said, to me, when they asked me to do something for you that was representative of your creativity, it was as if you planted seeds which sprouted and grew beautiful things. This is just the, uh, the sprouting of a seed, which I've tried to, to depict in this uh, form, which I hope is beautiful to you. Well, see, yeah, that is nice. I like that. He said, I'm glad it isn't a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> so that's still with the studio, and uh, I swear it still looks like a turkey. <laughs> but then I'm not an artist. Either. Uh, I believe... Well, of course, it goes without saying that, well, he used to say, I can't carry a tune in a basket, but the great Disney tunes, the ones that have all appeared, while he didn't actually do the composing, they wouldn't have occurred if it hadn't been for Walt. Just the same way that the animation, while he didn't do the animation, nevertheless, it would never have occurred if it hadn't been for Walt. And uh, typical might be an experience that George Bruns had, who composed the jingle, Baby Crockett. And <clears throat> Walt had entrusted uh, George, who was a vener venerated composer, to work with this director who was more or less new to Walt, who was doing the directing on the, on the Baby Crockett series, to come up with a theme song. So George, as it turned out, had come up with this lovely, uh, this, I, I happen to like Baby Crockett song, even the coonskin hats. And uh, the director had cut George off at the knees. He said, what, hey, George, that's awful. He said, that's no dignity, that's just a jingle. He said, come up with something good. And he walked out and George sat there depressed. And he had a little cubic over room with a little upright piano and George was still sitting there diddling this tune during the noon hour, wondering what in the heck to do. And as Walt was often known to do, he happened to be walking past George's room. He walked, hey George, what's this you're playing? And George said, oh, that's, that's something that's just been thrown out. What do you mean thrown up? I said, uh, uh, Walter didn't like that. Well, he did. It's play it for me. So he played it for me. Hey, he said, that's terrific. Well, the next thing you know, that, that director wasn't there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we came up with this as a song. <coughs> Baby, Davy Crockett. And Walt was capable of getting in and helping us physically. Well, the, um, I had finished doing all the work on the original Fantasyland. How am I doing? Does it get too late? Oh, it is, isn't it? Questions? I'll, I'll, I'll cut this off. <laughs> yeah, you better stop. Yeah? Yeah, of all the teachers that you've worked on, the animated teachers, what is your favorite and what's your best sequence of doing you've done in this year? Well, I suppose I love Fantasia. Uh, just from a satisfying sense, although I was only involved in the pastoral part of it, which I don't think is the best part by any means, but it was the last part to be done, and we have an excuse for it's not being quite up to all the other parts in the Fantasia, because we were rushed to try and get it done so that the whole picture could be released. But I still love the overall picture Fantasia, but I think my very favorite is Snow White, because Snow White, I still love it even though there are inadequacies in the animation and things we would do differently today, things we could go by, 
It represented a time when we finished Snow White, we had no money. Those of us who worked on it loved it so much that we went out with our own silk screen made posters and these little white posters with green printing and tacked them up on telephone poles all over Hollywood. That's how it got known. There was no way, we had no money to advertise it. We just did it ourselves. And uh, have I got two minutes? Well, I, I think I should tell you how Snow White started because no other feature started that way and it was so inspirational and bears telling. And there's some amusing aspects to it too because one day there were about 50 of us in all in the studio and Walt gave us uh, 50 cents a piece which would probably be somewhere between the equivalent, I don't know how to figure it out, between 12 and 15 dollars today. He said, you guys go get yourself some dinner and come back here. He said, I want you in the, we had a sound stage. So, uh, little barn type room at one end was a projection booth and there was a nice hardwood floor. We somebody put basketball on it and there were a tier of eight rows of seats. So we went across the street to Ma Applebaum's, most of us, and uh, we ate sumptuously for 35 cents. At least I did. I don't think anybody spent over 40 cents. Had everything, roast beef, potatoes, oh, wonderful dinner, and even ice cream. And for 35 cents, so we, we were profitable. We made 15 cents profit. And feeling very, very smug when we came back and took our seats, not knowing what to expect. And Walt had the lights turned on in this room, which was probably the same size as one half of this room. If you had a wall, where there isn't one here. And we were sitting in these seats, and Walt got out in front, and he started to tell us his story. And not until then, at least I had never even heard a rumble about a, a feature picture, maybe some other people in a little closer did, but I didn't know anybody that did. And Walt became, he was this amazing actor. Here he was with just a little light on him and nothing but void and darkness behind him. He acted out the dwarves, he told the story, he became Snow White, he became the huntsman, he became the witch, the queen, and all of these things with dialogue that isn't too different from the dialogue we got. He was so inspirational. We didn't even realize it was 11.30 when we broke up. And he lit such a fire under this group of people that we, to us, it was an enormous pleasure. We would have worked all night, every night, if we could have. If we could have done Snow White, the justice that he did it in acting and passing it on to us, it would have been something that would never be equal. He would, he, what is there is, is a, sort of the aftermath of the inspiration that he gave us. The shot, we, when we got all finished, we were sitting back, we thought, boy, well, that's, we've done it now, there's nothing else to do. We're never going to know it. And about a month later, we said, well, he better tell us another story. <laughs> and then about three months later, we realized he was never going to tell us another story. So from then on, we had to suggest things. And then Sharpstein suggested uh, Pinocchio. And then and Pinocchio, we had a chance to make use of all the lessons we'd learned on the Snow White picture. And Snow White, uh, Pinocchio is a much more adept use of animation and uh, the medium that we were able to do in Snow White. But Snow White was a trailblazer, and to me, it's my favorite. Have you had enough? Why we, how about one more question? <laughs> Did you have one, John? Did you have a question? No, I just want to thank you. It was wonderful. Oh. <laughs> Thank you all. Appreciate it.